It lays a busy class. There's a lot of information in these slides over here. It's all just an overview of what the course is about and how we plan to run it. And 4N is one of those courses that is unique at MAC. It's um, quite different to anything else you've ever taken. And it's very different to any other course given at any other university. It's, uh, it's got some special aspects that you won't find anywhere else. And that's what we need to discuss today and, uh, and get through. So let's start with something a little unusual. Just think for a minute. What did you learn this summer? Something about yourself? Did you learn something interesting at a co-op term, perhaps? Something about ChemEng? Just think back over the past four months. Something that you learned that you thought was really neat and interesting, either about yourself or about your future career. <coughs> and hold that thought, because this concept of thinking about what you've learned and reflecting back and just the fact that you're thinking and realizing that you've learned something is what 4N is about. Okay? So you'll see this come up over and over, and it doesn't just apply to learning work-related stuff about heat exchanges and distillation columns and control loops. It applies to every part of your life. So we're going to see this coming up many times. It's a skill we're going to learn in 4N um, if you haven't learned to read. So, so just, just uh, start with that, and we'll take that question up in the tutorial on Monday as well. Let's go then to where this course comes from, to put it in context. So Don Woods joined the chemical engineering department back in the 1960s, I think 64. <coughs> he was the main instructor for this course all the way up to 2000, and brought a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge from his prior career as a, as a chemical engineer into the department. Tom Wyland joined the department and then took over this course. Tom came from ExxonMobil and had a good 10, 15 years of experience in the petroleum industry, and he added to this course as well. A few other instructors have taught it in between, and then myself, this is my second go at it. So I'm using a lot of their material. I've got about 20 boxes of Don Woods' stuff in my condo and in my office. When he passed away, his wife kind of offloaded it on me, and I'm quite happy to accept it because there's so much good material in there. Um, so I've been pretty selective, and I'll be using that in my course. I'll be using a lot of Tom Marlin slides. So a lot of the work I'm presenting here is not mine at all. It's all building up on a lot of good, solid bases that we um, are very fortunate to have here at Mac. Uh, so doc, uh, Dr. Woods and Tom Marlin are both world, world widely known. Um, people would come just to meet with Don Woods and Tom Arnold to get some insight into their experiences in this course material on problem-based learning and the other material we've been presenting for it. Okay, so so it's, it's very unique and I think uh, we're quite lucky to be here in this room uh, going through some of that material. A bit about myself, um, it's all out there for you to read. I'm originally from South Africa, University of Cape Town. I've worked in a number of companies here in Canada since I graduated from MAC uh, back in 2002. I worked at Glaxo most recently, full time here since 2012. If you're looking to uh, speak with me one on one, um, I'm in DSB, not in JHE. And the best way to do that is to arrange a meeting by email. That's the best <coughs> way I, I can arrange to meet you. I can let you know when I'm free and uh, we can then meet you over there. We have two amazing TAs um, for this course, Danielle and Chris. Uh, Danielle is doing her masters with Todd. She's almost done. She's just had a setback, a magnet broke. <laughs> so that means she's got lots of time to help you out. Until <laughs> <laughs> we fix it, and then I won't exist. <laughs> so Danielle, do you want to stand up and just introduce yourself a bit? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Danielle Maitland. I'm doing my master's on magnetic drug release, which is difficult when your magnet is broken. Um, I'm taking the afternoon tutorial, right? and uh, if you want to set up any times to meet, just shoot me an email. And uh, I'm not really, we're not really doing office hours; it's just for the drop-in basis. And then we have Chris uh, for the morning tutorial. Hi everyone, it's nice to see all of you. You might recognize me from 3P. I work for Dr. Christopher Schwartz. I'm working with applied optimization. Um, I'm a semi-recent graduate from McMaster, the master program. I graduated in 2012, so I took this course myself with Dr. Master for Kevin Puttick, and uh, I'm excited to team. So, nice to meet all of you, and I look forward to working with you guys. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you, you don't have to stay around for the rest of the class if you can see 
Um, so as, as we've written up here, just, uh, just note for the TAs, the best way to contact them is by email. And uh, so arrange with them when it's mutually convenient. This is especially true in this course where often you have to <coughs> TAs in your groups. So I'll talk about the groups coming up in a minute. But it will be very often that it's not just you meeting with TAs, it's your group. So arrange with your group at a good time and then meet up with the TA that way. So it's all by email in this course. There's no office hours. Uh, they tend not to be very useful because everyone's schedule is so different in this course. So the relationship between myself and, and you and the TAs and yourself is not the regular relationship that you have. Okay? In this course, I'm your manager, the TAs are your manager, and we're colleagues. Okay? See it as you're in a company, I might be your, your boss or your manager nominally, but we're in this together and it's not just an instructor-student relationship. You'll see that coming through with group meetings that you have with me in my office. You'll come with an agenda, with a plan, with set questions. It's a very professional relationship that you would experience, for those of you that have had co-op terms already. Um, and if you haven't, the moment you start working, that's that nature of the relationship is, is what we're going to be having here. So what that means is it's we're professional. We send emails with proper subject lines, with clear discussion on what you, you're asking me, or I'm replying back to you clearly. Um, so, so there's just a note here on subject lines. Start it always with your group number so if we can put you in context. Very clearly written communication. All that material you learned in 2G is going to be assumed in this course. Please email from your MacMaster address. You wouldn't email your boss at work from your Hotmail or Gmail account. So the same idea applies here. And that's simply because we filter our emails, the TAs and myself, and MacMaster emails get priority, because so that's our work-related stuff. The TAs also, as you saw, they're, they're in groups. So Danielle is in group B in the afternoon, and Chris is in group A. So you will email the TA for your group. The, re the reason for that is there are 90 students in the class. 45 of you are with Chris, and 45 of you are with Danielle. It's just easier for you to build up that relationship with one person rather than dealing with two separate TAs on, on your issue. So if you're in the morning tutorial group, please you deal with Chris. If you're in the afternoon tutorial group, group B, you'll deal with Daniel. I record these classes, uh, both the video and audio, and I post that on the, on the course website, usually within a day or so. As I've described before, it's not always the best quality because there's other sounds, people coming and going in the room, there might be ambient noise being picked up, so the audio quality may not be the best, the visual quality may not be the best, but it's there for you to catch up. Many of you will be going for job interviews in the middle of the semester, um, or you would have to skip days for whatever reason, so you can use it to catch up, but the main idea is that you use it to go back to a concept that halfway through the class uh, you may be phased out, you weren't paying attention, you want to recap it, or maybe you just need to hear it explained a second time. So that's the purpose of, the, of those recordings. Um, there's no guarantee though that I'll always make them, right? There's sometimes the camera's broken in the past or I forgot to push the record button, so there's, there's no, no guarantee. Let's talk about references and readings. There's a lot of material for this course. There is no prescribed textbook. There's only two recommended books. So you don't have to buy either of these, but if you have the first one from 3G, that's great. The second one you've probably never seen before, but it is available in Thought Library on reserve. Um, either of those books cover some fraction of the course. There's no single book that covers everything. As you saw at the beginning, we've got a lot of material here from Don Woods and Tom Marlin. None of that exists in a printed textbook. Tom Marlin is writing a book at the moment, but it doesn't exist yet. We will, in fact, have posted various draft chapters from his newest textbook on the course website. So you'll be some of the first people to use that material um, and it's really, really current, top-notch, the latest research on various topics. But there's no single book that I can recommend for you for this course. But where we do cover topics from either of these books, I'll make mention of the chapter and page numbers so that if you happen to have either one of them, you can go and get a second reading on the material. So all of that uh, material that I do post for you 
the assignments, the tutorials, the slides that we uh, have in this course, all of that goes through the course website, learnchc.mcmaster.ca.4m4. I expect you to check that website every day. Uh, so unlike other courses where you can go once or twice a week, this course, there's a lot of stuff coming every day. There will be almost always a new announcement every day posted. So if you go look at the course website, here's a screenshot of the top left corner. The announcements get posted over here. I take old ones away. Uh, you can always go see the old announcements there on that link. Um, but the newer ones will be posted over there. If checking a website is something that you're going to forget about, I recommend that you subscribe to the Twitter feed uh, at that 4 and 4 CHE handle. That way the announcements get pushed to you, to your phone or whatever device you prefer, and you don't need to come check the website. So I'll, whenever I post a new, a new tutorial or assignment or, or an announcement of some sort, I'll also tweet it and then you can get it that way. The tutorials and assignments will, are on Monday, but the, the actual material for it will be usually posted by Friday evening, um, and maybe sometimes on the weekends if it's, if it's getting busier in the term. So that you'll have it for Monday to, to do your group-based tutorial. There will be a tutorial every Monday. Now when I say tutorial assignment, I use the two interchangeably. There's no difference in my mind. Each tutorial is an assignment that gets handed in. That means there's about 10 or 11 assignments in this course. It's a busy, uh, constant churn of material that's being submitted and that you're working on. The same as would be in any other professional work environment. They're always working on the reports and draft materials for your colleagues and your boss. It's the same deal here in 4 -hand. Now, there will be times where you want to let me know that something's going wrong or something's going well that you appreciate or uh, you didn't quite understand an explanation in class and you didn't get a chance to raise your hand and ask for clarification, or you just didn't feel that comfortable asking the question at that time, you didn't know how to phrase it to sound just right, maybe you just need a bit of time to go home, think about it, but you still don't quite understand something, feel free to send me an email directly, or you can use the course website, uh, sorry, not the course website, this uh, URL over here, feedback-questions. You can fill in your question over here or your comments, you can optionally add your email and then send me a message. If you don't add your email address, I obviously cannot respond to you. I will receive the message, um, and then if I see that it's appropriate, I can take it up in the next class. But if, it's, uh, if there's no email and you're asking a, a direct question, I really cannot reply to you that way. Okay, before we move on uh, from there, are there any questions so far? We're going to talk about grading next, we're going to talk about group work next, we're going to talk a bit about what is in this course. But so far on the course website, textbooks, on those administrative issues, no questions yet. Super. So let's take a look and just understand actually where 4 and 4 sits in the context of the rest of the courses at Mac. So you may not realize it or uh, maybe you, you, you it sounds obvious, but a lot of thought goes into the sequencing of courses we have here at Mac. Um, this structure we have in our courses is intentional and has been refined since the 1980s. It's gone through several iterations, but we've kind of settled on this structure. In your second year and third year, you've got a lot of science and math courses, chemistry, your two ZZ courses, you've got the 3E process modeling course. In your second year, you have your two core, 2D and 2F analysis courses. So these set the groundwork for what ChemEng is about. But then we build on those uh, through a sequence of courses which we call engineering science. So these are very technical sort of courses, heat transfer, fluid flow, mass transfer, thermo, reactor design, process control, very mathematically oriented, very technically oriented science courses that introduce chemical engineering as a science. And then you've got your applied labs, 2I, 3L, 4L, that, that build on top of all of that material. But then you've got this other sequence of courses going, which we call the design sequence. So 2G, 3G that you've taken already, now you're here in 4N and then you're going to take 4W. So I kind of sit in the middle here between uh, these courses. I work with Tom Adams in 3G and I work with the instructors in 4W to make sure that 
what I'm getting in and what I'm going to hand over to them uh, works. And how that goes is in 3G, you learn all about flow sheeting, how to set up your flow sheet, how to pull in various pieces of equipment and assemble them. So you sequence up your, your unit operations. We call that, we try to make it sound fancy, but it's called synthesis. Huh? Just basically structuring a sequence of unit operations. So how do you synthesize a flow sheet, build it up, it is basically what you've learned in 3G. And you've done a lot of that in Aspen, and Aspen uses those correlations that, uh, that Tom has discussed in his course. Now in 4N, we assume that that flow sheet is built, but now we look at a whole lot of other aspects around the safety of the process. Is it profitable? How easy is it to operate that process? How are we going to start it up or shut it down? How are we going to comp uh, control it with process control groups? We're also going to look at a whole bunch of economics at the top. So we'll go a bit more into what 4N is in a minute, then I'm going to hand you over to 4W, and 4W, you're going to bring both of these together, 3G and 4N, and you're going to apply it in whichever section in 4W you happen to work in. So 4W is divided into three groups. And whichever group you work in, you're going to, all, all three groups will do the same. You're going to have to define your project, select the technology, build up your flow sheets. So that's all material from the 3G. Then you're going to cost out that equipment, so the economics of it, and how do you go <coughs> operate that equipment day to day. Okay, so Next term, you're going to be using this material in a lot of different ways, as well as the material from 3G. And we haven't really spoken about 2G, but professional communication. We take that as a given in 3G and in 4N and in 4W, that you know how to write a good email, that you know how to structure a report, and clearly communicate your findings. Okay, so that uh, 2G course, you've had a number of opportunities to use it, and you will continue to do so. Now I can say personally from my side, working with a whole variety of companies over the past 10 years, that that sort of material in 2G is phenomenally important. You may not always know technically what you're doing, but if you come across clearly and can explain yourself, that goes a long, long way. And so you're going to have a lot of opportunities to, to practice that skill here in 4N. Writing cover letters, writing reports, um, and, and you need to refine that skill and improve on it if you feel that you're not comfortable with it because guaranteed the day you start working you can you can be technically brilliant but if you can't communicate your ideas you still come across as an idiot so you need to be very very good at communication now in this course uh, one way to to see it is we're, we're used to flow sheets right as Ken mentioned but we've never really looked at it from a different aspect. We're going to look at that flow sheet in a very different way. We're going to look at reasons why, for example, that valve is over here and not over there. And why the valve V5 over there at the top of the column is used to control the pressure loop over there. Why are we using T6 at the top of the distillation column and pairing it with that valve on this heat exchanger entry over here? So why are we making those decisions? How are those decisions made? We don't always design processes as chemical engineers. The vast majority of you will go and work, but may not ever design processes from scratch. But you have to understand why those decisions were made by other designers. Also, you may face situations where the previous design is just screwed up, right? So you may have to go redesign small sections of the flow sheet. So we'd never pretend that we're going to go in and design entire chemical plants on our own, or with, even with other groups. Most of us will just end up operating processes, troubleshooting processes on a day-to-day -day basis, and making minor changes to existing processes. So we still have to understand why these pairings are made originally, and recognize bad decisions, and how we can rectify them and make better decisions. Okay. Some of those decisions are made for safety reasons, some of them are made so that we can operate the process just in an easier manner than we would normally otherwise have. Okay, so those are all very important. And then, again, the section of engineering economics comes in from here. So and yet another way to see what 4N is about. Here in the center, we've got a unit. It happens to be a reactor, but it could be any unit. It could be a heat exchanger, a distillation column, or any other separator. Here we've got a reactor. 
And that reactor is made to be a certain size. It's got a heating coil. And that's now pre-designed and operating. But 4N is going to consider everything around that reactor. We're going to look at the economics. How much does this reactor cost to buy, to install, to operate? How many people do we need to run it every day? So there's a whole lot of economic aspects. It's not just a reactor anymore. There's a whole lot of money associated with that. And if your company is losing money, you're going to be out of a job. So we need to understand the money side of things as well. How much profit is that reactor making for me? How long is it going to take for me to pay off the reactor's cost? A lot of those economic decisions will also impact how that process operates and the troubleshooting of that process. Maybe that cooling coil hasn't been correctly sized. The heat or cooling capacity isn't sufficient. So when we're facing troubles in operating this process on a day-to-day -day basis, what can we do to go change that process? So there's going to be instances of where the process is not doing what we want it to do. It's not doing its intended de design. We need to go change the operation or in an emergency modify how that process is operating. What do we go do? That's troubleshooting. And troubleshooting can be extremely nervous. Nerve wracking, I should say. If you're in a company and things are going wrong now and you need to fix them now, <coughs> You don't have time to go sit back and think about the fluid dynamics in that reactor and the first principles heat transfer equations going on. Right? You need to make decisions fairly quickly and it can be quite intense. So we're going to learn a very structured approach that you can follow to troubleshoot the process. So Tom Marlin will actually come in and be a guest lecturer in the last few weeks of this course and he's going to teach that section and he's going to teach us those skills. Um, on how to effectively troubleshoot the process. We'll also learn about safety. We're not just going to say this reactor exists on its own, but recognize that there's people around it. And not just you as an, as an engineer, nor just your operators, but there's a neighborhood and a city living around your process as well. So their safety and our safety inside the plant is really, really important. How do we instrument our process so that it operates in a safe manner. How do we set up alarms? How do we react to those alarms are, are really a critical part. So we'll spend two, three weeks looking at safety. We'll look at previous disasters in the chemical industry, like things that have gone wrong, why they went wrong, and what could have been done differently, and what should be done to keep our processes operating safely. Now last year I taught this class, the very first question I had was, my company's got a small budget and don't, won't spend money on safety, right? So what do we do in those cases? What's, like, so we'll learn about layers of safety. There's certain minimal safety layers, minimum requirements that we have, and then we can build on those to get more and more sophisticated, okay? And that, that question also ties into ethics. There's a whole lot of ethics that go on in, in the engineering practice. So it's another skill we're going to learn in this course, is how do we deal with some of those ethical issues? Then finally, we'll look at operability. How do we operate this process, start it up, shut it down, um, and keep it going? So, so we're looking at everything around the units that you've learned. The past three, four years, you've learned about heat exchanges, distillation columns, various unit operations, but we've never discussed any of these other four issues that surround that unit. And they're all four very important aspects we need to be very comfortable with. And as I said over there at the bottom, uh, as far as I know, this is a unique course. It's not taught anywhere else in Canada. So other, other universities will teach safety, other universities will look at economics, but the troubleshooting and operability part is not taught at any other university in Canada that uh, I'm aware of. And that's all uh, Dr. Marlin and Don Woods' material that we're using their respective. Okay, so that's the technical side of this course, but there's a whole lot of other skills that we're going to be learning. As I said at the beginning, the relationship between me and you here is a professional one. Uh, so that's the first one. But there's also some other professional attitudes that you need to have. Recognize in this course that I'm not here delivering material for you to write down and then repeat back in a midterm or final exam. That will happen to some extent, but there's a lot of responsibility on you for your learning in this course. So that means you need to go and read publications like these that talk about various unit operations and operation of these processes. So 
the, the headline there's on membrane filtration, but some of the other subheadings are more important, like how to deal with high capacity distillation, what to do about failing, uh, what to do about process failures, what does it mean to be a professional engineer, how do you, well, what is process analytical technology? So this is a new term that's come up over the f past five, ten years. What is PAT? What is process mapping? Flow meter selection. So when I was a great, when I was an undergraduate student, things like process mapping and PAT were unheard of. But to work as an engineer in today's environment, I have to understand those terms. Okay, so I never got look, taught PAT in undergrad, but at GlaxoSmithKline, PAT was a huge deal. It's a huge deal in that company because it's a regulated environment with Health Canada and the FDA working with the company. So PAT is something I had to learn on my own. What is it? How is it applied to my work environment? No one's going to teach me that. Okay, so we need to learn these skills on how to learn. So you're responsible for your own learning. I'll mention here one, one good reason that you should have for doing this. When I was at Glaxo, a guy came to my desk on the 23rd of December and told me he'd just been fired. He'd been fired because he'd been in the pharmaceutical industry for 25 years. These were his own words. He knew why he was fired. He'd been in the pharmaceutical industry for 25 years and had never kept up to date with anything. He just did exactly what he was told. He was writing a report when told to write a report, but took no initiative to learn and extend his skills. So here's a guy, 50 years old, could work for another 10 years, just being fired. Tough to find a new job for the next five to 10 years of your life with no skills that are needed in that environment. If you're not taking the initiative to keep yourself up to date, you will get along easily for the next 10, 15 years, but there's going to be a point in time where your skills that you've learned here in university are not good enough to keep going. Okay, so we have to, just for that reason alone, keep up to date with our field. You need to be aware of the PEO in this course, and we'll also talk about engineering ethics at, at a later stage. So the key here is we're building on our engineering science, those core courses 2D, 2F, 2O, 3O, 3A, all those core fluid flow, heat transfer, mass transfer courses. Those things were around when People like Dr. Marlin was studying chemical engineering. The people like Don Woods was studying chemical engineering. He studied those same courses. Okay, but we have to then build on them and take them a step further. So we'll always have our engineering science as our background, and then we're going to supplement that with the newer material in this course. And then finally, here's a whole list of other skills I think we will also cover. Or well, not I think, I know we will cover. So let's take a look at that. You'll learn a bit of presentation skills. So in the tutorials, I'll have you stand up and present your solution to the rest of the 45 people in the room, periodically. Um, you'll learn as a team, as a group of five that you're going to work with on Monday already, in your groups, you're going to set goals for yourselves. You're going to have to be a group chairperson at least twice this term, and a group member for the other eight times. You're going to have to learn to deal with a good functioning group and a dysfunctioning group. So there's no guarantee that you're all going to be in great function groups. And even if you are in a great function group, some weeks that group's not going to work well at all. You're going to have different people with different moods, different ways of thinking, and it's not always going to work out. So we're going to have to learn to deal with that dysfunctionality. You're going to have to learn to come up with some interesting and creative ideas to solving problems. You're going to have to find some materials to go learn on your own. Is this a good, reliable reference or not? So just coming up with that decision skill is, is an important one. Troubleshooting, we're going to learn a lot about in the last few weeks of the course. Your technical writing skills will have a good chance to be improved. Uh, writing cover letters, checking your grammar and spelling. You're going to have a lot of group work around this. So you're going to submit group reports so it's not just you writing, but you're going to have your group writing and bringing that together. So the group is going to help you out and improve those skills. You're going to have to learn how to learn on your own. That's a skill you probably have already from uh, many other courses here. We're going to look at economic data, ethics, some ethical questions, and 
inadvertently, whether you like it or not, managing your time is a huge deal in fourth year. And I'll talk about that in a bit more, but we all have five or six courses on the go here in this class, and you've got almost no free time for yourself. Multiple assignments, exams, midterms coming up. You probably have some idea of how to manage your time already. You've not reached this point in the university career without experiencing that, but you're going to have to get really good at it now. Okay? My final year was still stands out in my mind as one of the two or three times in my life where I've never worked harder since then. Okay, so there have been a few other times that I've, I have worked harder than my final year, but it was intense. Okay, so you need to be good at managing your time and it's almost it's the same as managing projects. So many of you, when you go out to work as engineers, <coughs> companies tend to like assigning project management to engineers. Okay, there's something about the engineering skill set that works well from a project management perspective. You can handle multiple constraints, you can see the bigger picture, you've got good time management skills. And that just comes from the way you've learned engineering in undergrad. So it's a good skill to have, it's a good, um, a good resume builder in the future. I mean, not this experience is a good resume builder, but in the future managing projects in a company shows good leadership and good skills. And to get into that role, you need to be able to prove that you can do it. And here's one, one way that you can start to build up those skills. We'll go look back at PNID diagrams. So some of you may have forgotten about those. And then ambiguity and uncertainty shows up in a lot of the questions and issues we face. OK, any questions on that so far? So a lot of skills, not just a whole lot of technical stuff in this course, but a whole lot of other things that are really, they're not listed in the course of <coughs> mine, um, but they're really super important skills to have for your career in the future. So here's, um, here's some of my unsolicited advice is on managing your time. In this course, the time we spent in class, the three hours in class, is only about a quarter of the work you need to do. You probably need to be spending at least eight to nine hours per week outside this class time on this course, okay? You will need to, I mean, not necessarily now in week one and two and three, but very quickly from week four onwards, you're going to be spending at least that amount of time outside class on this course. You do need to prioritize your life, your social life versus your personal, uh, versus your academic life. Um, I don't suggest you go only academic for the next eight months. Definitely not, don't do that. But there will be times where you have to just say no to your friends and family. There will be, guaranteed, uh, midterm time, end of term time, you're gonna have to make some tough decisions on whether you choose to do, not 4N necessarily, but other fourth year courses and final year courses versus your social life. Absolutely, you're gonna have to make those tough decisions. It's all part of time management. Um, I suggest you do work on the weekends at least one of the days, but it won't be on 4N all the time, it will be on other courses as well, just because that's the amount of, of work you have in this course, in this year. Right? Fourth year is a tough year with this course, with all your electives. It's, it's a mess, right? but it's something you have to face and, and work through, and everyone does. Right? They always have a good class coming out at Kipling. Well, I'll see you guys all at Kimpler, pretty much guaranteed, right? But you're going to be very different people between now and April next year. Okay, so, so just uh, bear that in mind. It's going to be a tough, a tough time, but you'll get there. Um, on the way there, I suggest you, you, you just do some things that you, you, you all should be doing and know about. It's regular exercise, whether you do that on your own um, or you do it as a group. That might be a suggestion just to go with your group members and do a cardio class, a yoga class, uh, just get to kind of know each other a bit. Um, at the very minimum, consider walking to campus instead of taking the bus. Just something simple like that to clear your mind out at the beginning or at the end of the day. Um, communicate is a big thing. Uh, it's a big thing in our personal lives with our partners, with our families, with our friends. Communication is a big deal. You're going to have to learn to communicate with your group members. The other four people you're working with talk about how you feel in terms of the workload, in terms of the stresses you're all facing, and talk about time management, why you want to meet at certain times. Right? 
keep an open discussion going between the teammates. Team members. Eat well, your body is simply just a bioreactor, and sleep. If you're trying to put three, four hour nights sleep back to back for multiple days, you're going to burn out, and that's not going to be great. Please, please consider just eating a balanced meals regularly and, and sleeping. Right? So this is just, we all know this stuff, but <laughs> come November, December, you're not going to be eating well, you're not going to be sleeping well. Just try to think about it, get into a regular habit now so that later on it's just easier to stay. Okay, so that's all unsolicited advice. What I do want to emphasize though here is if you experiencing any troubles, you need to communicate early. So last year there were a few groups that had blow-ups happen, and they happened in December. Last week of November, December. Really, I, can't, I cannot do anything at that time. If your group is so mismanaged and dysfunctional, and I didn't hear about it early on, there's very little I can do. So you do need to communicate amongst your team members very clearly early. And if things really cannot get resolved, there's always myself and the TA to talk with. This year I will try something new. I will have an opportunity for you to provide anonymous feedback about your peers. So it will be web-based, fill in a form. I will see it only. The TAs won't even see it. Um, I will see it and if there's consistent trends, I will take action. Okay, so it's a and if there's some good feedback, I will definitely feed it back to the rest of your team members. So it's a totally anonymized uh, way of, of just, it's just a way for me to track that things are going well. And I may stop this if, it, if I don't see any benefit from it, but uh, let's give it a try. We'll see, it's, um, last year there was a few groups that really didn't work out well, and it was because there was a lot of fear of communication. So this way it should try to take some of that away. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's uh, uh, talk about grading here. As you see the grading breakdown, group-based assignments 25%. So expect about 10 or so assignment tutorials. It's a uh, big group project, but that's broken down into a group meeting that will be graded, an interim report, and a final report that's graded uh, for a total of 28%. There's the midterm, there's the final exam, and then there's some online short questions, online reflections about your work, and about the peer feedback that counts up to 12%. So it's a very generous course breakdown in terms of the final exam, but that's always how it's been in this course. It's that 4N has a very low final exam, but there's a lot of intensity throughout the course on the assignments that really are important. They count for a big chunk and that project as well. If you add that up, you can quickly see that it's about a 60-40 split for group work versus individual. So that doesn't sit well with the type A personalities in this room and like to do everything on their own. Okay. So think about that. If you're that type of person where you like to have full control over what you submit and what you do, this course is going to be a new thing for you. Right? You're going to have to work with your group. There's no way, the volume of work required is so much that there's no way you can do it on your own. So you're going to have to learn to delegate and deal with your group and work together to achieve those group assignments and group projects. Um, so please, uh, please bear that in mind. There are some other important notes in the course outline regarding grading. Please read those. Nothing uh, major. Those are the major points up there. Um, in terms of midterms, the midterm is on the 16th of October. It only covers process economics. The final exam is uh, whenever it's scheduled, and it will be cumulative of everything. So including the economic section. And all the test exams are open notes and any help here. Okay. Um, let's talk about tutorials. So your first tutorial is on Monday. This coming Monday, 9th of September, GHE 342. You may have chosen already a slot in your timetable for the, either the morning or the afternoon. I don't know what it's called in the timetable, C1 and C2 or something like that. Um, I'm calling them A and B, morning and afternoon. So depending on which slot you're in, you're going to be at that tutorial. But the tutorials and assignments are group based. Okay. So we're going to form groups 
and I've got the class list. I'm going to look at the class list and see which tutorial group you're in, and I'm going to form groups so that obviously you're all at the tutorial either in the morning or all five of you in the tutorial in the afternoon. Okay, now some of you have flexibility. Some of you can either, your timetable allows you to move to the afternoon if you're currently set for the morning. Okay, so there's going to be a questionnaire that you need to fill out today, and it needs to be filled out by the end of uh, today, preferably. I will accept uh, entries tomorrow. But that questionnaire is going to help me form the group so that I can make sure all five of you are in the tutorial slot together. So, and that, that questionnaire will also allow you to pick some of your group members. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But the way the tutorials will be structured is that you're either going to be in the morning or the afternoon. The group will work on the tutorial assignment for an hour and a half, and then the last half hour is spent comparing answers between the, the groups in the room. So there's about nine groups in JG 342. Each of the groups will have a chance to come up and present some of their answers in that last half an hour. That way you're seeing the other people's work and other people's approach to the problem. And then it's up to your group to write up a final solution that's due on the Friday. So tutorial on the Monday, hand in on Friday. Nothing on the weekend. So that's intentionally structured like that. Tutorial on the Monday, you work as it on the group over the weekend, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then electronically or paper on Friday at this class. Okay. And in the tutorial, there will be a lot of open-ended questions. Like I said, that whole idea of learning how to learn on your own is really, really important. So many of the tutorial questions will be stuff I haven't actually even covered in class yet. In fact, most of the times the tutorial questions on Monday will be questions that we will only cover in class on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. So you're learning ahead yourself. That's why I want to teach you that skill of how to learn ahead. Having an internet-enabled device in the tutorial is going to help you a lot to do that. Being able to look up information within your group on the fly in that tutorial time is, is really important. Not showing up to the tutorial is letting your group down. So you're working in groups of five, your group is trying to work together to get that assignment done as really as quick as possible. If you can finish most of it in the tutorial time, your group doesn't have to meet on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday face to face. So the idea is that that Monday tutorial, you guys make the most of that time in the two hours and get most of the work done, and then tidy up the loose ends for your submission on Friday. So it works out really well last year that way, and, and I'm going to keep, keep going at that. Um, some groups choose not to do anything. Like they use the time just to chat and socialize, and that's fine if you're willing to work on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, later on. But the idea is tutorials, you must show up. Like I'm not, I, I come around with a name list just to check it off, just so that I can learn your name. So I'm not using it to track attendance. But not showing up to the tutorial is like not showing up at work. Okay, we don't do that as a professional. You don't just choose not to show up at work one day. Okay, so it's the same, same idea. You need to be there with your group and work on it together. And that idea of working in a group is going to be important because you're going to all get to know each other. So that by the time this project comes in, in October and November, you already know each other. So the tutorials are a way for you to get to know each other's different skills and personalities. And then you're going to be working on the project as well in your own time outside of class. So uh, we all know that group work is, a, uh, is widely seen in companies. Uh, you'll all work in groups after you graduate. It brings together a variety of viewpoints and expertise. Uh, it magnifies your strengths. So you get the five people in a group really deliver material that's more than what five people are worth because you've got so many different skill sets coming together there. So we, we, we know that and we understand that. The only thing that's a little bit unrealistic in our case is that we're all chemical engineers in the same group. When you go work out in a company, you might be the only chemical engineer in the group and you'll work with other, with other skill sets. But in this course, um, we, we have that just by the nature of how things are. Okay, so group selection, as I said, is internet-based. You'll go and fill in that questionnaire. It's posted on the course website already. Um, fill in that form. I really would hope that you can do it today still, because that way I can assign the groups today and have them posted on the course website by Saturday, at the latest Sunday. 
so that when you come in on Monday, you know who your other, five, other four group members are. So the groups will be five. There, there always are groups of five. Um, you will choose, as I said, your three names. I will take those three names into consideration. At least two of them I'll try to pair up. So if, if one person picks the other and vice versa, there's a good chance that both of you are going to be in the same group. But if one person picks one but not it's not reciprocated, I mean, it may not end up being in the same group. So it's a pretty complex problem for me to go and sort out and try to accommodate everyone's requests. I also have to deal with the fact that not all of you in the group that you'd like to be in are in the same tutorial slot. So I have a question on the questionnaire that asks, would you mind being shifted to the other slot? You can either respond yes, I prefer not to, but I will if you need to make a group, or absolutely no, it clashes with my schedule. So if you obviously cannot shift, I, you're going to have to, you might end up running in a group that's of people that you don't know. Okay, so bear that in mind when you, when, you create, when you select on the course website. Um, there's a bit of randomness in the group allocation. Sometimes at the end I just cannot mix uh, or meet your, meet your requirements, and so there's a bit of randomness that goes on. I try to put people in similar streams together, but not so that the whole group is all polymers, right? So, so I take all of those constraints into account. Uh, so come Monday, you may not like the group selection, but bear in mind that with a class of 90 and all those constraints, it's often the best I can do. Also bear in mind that when you work in practice, you don't have any say in your group formation. So here I'm trying to have some, some input from you, but not, uh, I obviously cannot accommodate every everyone is liking. Okay, so that link over there, that's a hyperlink in the PDF. You can click on that, or you can go to the course website and click on the questionnaire link there. Fill it out today. Um, I will keep the questionnaire open until the latest on Saturday. Uh, and then